since moved to Los Angeles, I need to update my uh, I need to update my file. Is it possible to get the uh, audio muted from over there? Perfect, awesome. Otherwise, I'm going to be hearing myself, and that's not going to work. Um, so, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak uh, with you all. Um, congratulations to the Data Justice Lab for opening. Um, it's such a critical component of uh, this broader conversation that we're having that we're having around data and social justice. Um, research is such an important part of, of what's needed. Um, and I say that um, as someone who has been working on these issues for a few years now, and um, it's always surprising to me just the amount of information that we don't know, um, particularly because um, you know there isn't the data and research to back it up. So the work of all of you all in that room and some of my esteemed panelists here uh, are so critical to the work that I do as a community organizer. Um, so I won't be able to do the twinkle fingers of you all today. Um, that would have been awesome so that I know what to focus on. But um, uh, I think what I'll do is I'll introduce uh, CNJ uh, and the work that we do um, and to provide you a bit of our kind of framework for how we look at uh, the work that we do, um, you know, define this term media justice. Uh, and then I thought I could go into um, just looking at the issues that we're particularly concerned with when we think about social justice in the digital age um, and provide you a few specific examples of places where we've done some active work in that space. Um, and just as a preview, I'll largely be focusing on surveillance. Um, so the three kind of technologies that I want to speak to are body-worn cameras, um, the use of cell phone interceptors, otherwise known as stingrays, and social media surveillance. And lastly, I'll just close out with kind of some of our thoughts about um, what the path forward looks um, in terms of our work, like what are the principles that are guiding the work that, that we do. Um, so cool. So, 20 minutes, 10, 10, I've got myself time, it's back in. Um, so Center for Media Justice is a national racial justice organizing hub uh, based in Oakland, California. Um, and what we do is we champion the media and technology rights of communities of color and um, of poor people here in the United States. Uh, the primary work we do is building grassroots leadership and we do that through a network that we call the Media Action Grassroots Network or MAGNET for short. Uh, currently, our network has about 100 racial justice uh, organizations based in every region of the United States. Um, kind of the core principle of what we do is that we believe that the right to communicate belongs to everyone. Um, and you know, we believe that, therefore, the right to transform our society does too. Um, media justice was born out of the reality um, as a response to a media system that was largely not reflected of our society. By the time CNJ was founded um, in 2008, the media system here in the United States uh, was already massively consolidated. In other words, there were a handful of companies that owned the majority of the media that we consumed. Um, at that time and today, this was also true that that amounts to about you know five to six companies, um, large media conglomerates, and I'm certain um, these dynamics are also very very much the same in other parts of uh, of the world. Um, but if you compare that here in the United States to back in the 1980s, uh, there were roughly about 50 companies that owned a lot of the media that we consume. So since in that time, there's been this massive level of consolidation. Um, and to speak to why that's harmful or, or why that's bad, um, I'll, I'll pull up a quote from Malcolm X who said that the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent look guilty and to make the guilty look innocent, and that's power. Uh, because they control the minds of the masses. Uh, now, when we think about this reality of our media system, um, we looked at it and knew that it wasn't just simply the result of you know, lucrative financial transactions. That was certainly a big part of it. Um, but undergirding those conditions um, were policies that were placed to allow for this level of consolidation to happen. Um, what's been true about um, advocating for media policy here in the United States is that that largely has been um, you know, consolidated in, in a handful of communities, lawyers, public interest groups, uh, but many of those that don't look anything like the communities that our network represents. Um, when media justice as a framework emerged, it really came out of media activists, um, mostly from communities of color, who were frustrated that the kind of resistance to changing our 
media system was largely white and was progressive, but largely white, um, and therefore not really accounting for the needs of our communities. Um, so that's where this media justice kind of framework emerged. And for us, we define it simply as, you know, media it, media justice is the transformation of, me, of, of media, both visual and structural, for the purpose of social change. So we see a fundamental kind of, we see media as a fundamental vehicle um, for shaping the hearts and minds of people in the United States um, for the purpose of pushing forward ideas, solutions, uh, and stories uh, grounded in, in, in social justice. Um, so we believe that in order to change racism and poverty, we have to transform our media system. And in the digital age today, increasingly that means fighting for our digital rights. Um, over the years, uh, some of the work that we've done has largely focused on the media representation, um, rights to the internet, uh, more affordable access to different vehicles of communication. Those have been kind of the issues that we've tended to fight on. Um, you know, we knew that when we fight against media, uh, when we fight for media representation, like fighting for more radio stations owned by community groups, you know, we know that we're shaping and fighting back against hateful stereotypes. Uh, when we opposed media consolidation, um, you know, we knew that we were also standing up for the rights of workers whose jobs were being eliminated by these corporate mergers, and for families who were having to pay more just to stay connected. Um, so we tended to find issues um, within our network uh, to fight for where there was a clear intersection across media and social justice and racial justice. Um, lately, uh, a lot of that work has really driven us towards surveillance. Um, you know, like many people, I think we came, admittedly, we came to this issue um, in kind of the post-Edward uh, Snowden revelations world. Um, I think the, the slight difference or the slight caveat I would put out there is that, um, you know, the, the revelations of Edward Snowden popularized the idea that surveillance was happening here in the United States and abroad um, in massive scales. Um, what we understood to be true is just grounded in our history of the United States is that surveillance isn't random. Um, surveillance does have a very succinct purpose. Uh, and in the United States, that checkered history tends to you know, be directed towards um, voices of opposition um, and specific communities, so communities of color, um, activists, uh, immigrants, et cetera, uh, who are trying to hold government or police accountable. Um, so in that way, I think the way that we look at this work around surveillance uh, is to quote um, one of our members, the South LAPD Spine Coalition, who I know Virginia's done some work with here in LA. Um, you know, surveillance is not a, it's not about a moment in time; it's a continuation of history. So the way that we think about surveillance in the context of today, around the use of technology for surveillance, uh, we we understand that it's grounded in a much longer history, dating back to. Um, taking back to points out pro and even before that uh, red squads here in the United States. Uh, but there's a longer history here of how the state has used surveillance to the per for, for a specific purpose to target specific communities. Um, right now, I think the way that we are looking at uh, surveil the issue of surveillance has been to understand how uh, law enforcement agencies are adopting these technologies um, and providing them a mechanism to surveil people that they are, in effect, sworn to protect. Um, but it's, I think, important to understand the context for how, where these technologies are being adopted. Uh, what are the local conditions that are true on the ground um, where these technologies exist? Uh, it's no secret that in the United States, there is a problem of racist policing on the part of many police departments in the US. Uh, and particularly how it affects communities of color and in particular black communities. Um, I can only speak to like my own example here. I'll share a quick story um, just to give you a sense of the kind of my interaction with this, uh, you know, with this particular topic. Um, you know, when I first got my driver's license, I think I was in, in Los Angeles uh, where I grew up, you have to drive. This is the this is the driving city. Um, so the day that I could get a driver's license, if you can officially get a driver's license here at 15 and a half, um, I was at the local Department of Motor Vehicles applying for a driver's license. Uh, shortly after that, I got a car. Um, the second day I had my driver's license and my car, I was pulled over by Los Angeles Police Department for driving in a good neighborhood. And in fact, that's what they told me. This is a nice neighborhood, this is a nice car, what are you doing you know, driving in this neighborhood? 
Um, a few weeks after that, I got pulled over for driving in what they called the wrong neighborhood. Um, it so happened to be like a few blocks away from my home. Um, so take that as you will. Um, but that's been, that's been kind of my experience with police departments uh, here in the United States, and in particular in Los Angeles. Um, and for many communities of color, um, that's been that kind of frequent interaction with police departments in a context that doesn't really make sense is lived reality. Um, we see the consequences of that increased interaction with police in, when you look at our system of incarceration here in the United States. We have over 2 million people in the United States who are incarcerated. Um, we have millions more that routinely go in and out of jail, cycle in and out. Um, people who are arrested for various different reasons. Um, some, of the, some of the stuff that I think Virginia pointed at, um, particularly as it relates to homeless folks, like you see you know, that there are folks that are being kind of rounded up um, and, and have increased contact with police departments and in the US context that means communities of color. Um, so now we are given that context, like now technology is being applied to the function of policing. Um, so here's where I'll dive into some specific examples um, to talk about how this is playing out. Um, and I'll specifically also speak to like, the reasons why they're being adopted. So let's start with body-worn cameras. Um, you know, as folks, many folks are probably familiar with, um, in the aftermath of the murder of Michael Brown um, in Ferguson, Missouri, um, there was a, a massive outcry from uh, communities here in the United States uh, that, particularly those involved in the movement for Black Lives and you know, hashtag Black Lives Matter, um, calling for an end to police violence. Um, so in that, in that kind of aftermath of that murder in Ferguson, we also saw um, the death of Eric Garner in New York. Uh, we saw the, the murder of Freddie Gray in Baltimore, Maryland, which gave rise to further uprisings and protests. Um, you know, there was this kind of air of a need, this is back in 2015, there was a real air for a need to do something. And the solution that was promulgated um, at the very top from the White House uh, during the Obama administration and the Department of Justice is, well, we need to increase more accountability by local police departments. And the way we can do that is by the introduction of body-worn cameras, having police, police officers actually wear cameras um, in their persons. Um, these, you know, and so what they did is they, they made millions of dollars available for local police departments to adopt this. Uh, the reality is, however, that uh, body-worn cameras were a thing that were being adopted by local police departments before 2015, um, you know, going back to the early 2012, you can find examples of where uh, police departments were running pilot programs and adopting uh, body-worn cameras uh, for local policing. Um, and it wasn't really being done in, in a way to increase police accountability. Um, they were just being adopted because it's, it's another investigative tool um, in our arsenal. Um, when this first happened, we worked in partnership with uh, the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights and other civil rights organizations to promote some principles for body-worn cameras. As an institution, we are opposed to the use of these body-worn cameras by local police departments, but we also recognize that it's a reality that's happening across the country. So. Uh, there need to be some rules in place where those, where, where those, you know, where those uh, technologies exist. Um, you know, shortly after promoting some principles on body-worn cameras, we also participated in a report card that looked at how these devices were being used across the country. Um, that report was updated last year in August, um, and uh, you can check it out. It's called like Body-Worn Camera Scorecard uh, .org or BWC Scorecard .org. Um, and it looks at like 50 police departments across the country. At this point, most of the major cities in the United States have access to have some sort of a body-worn camera program in place. And many of those places don't have a written policy that you can access. So us as the public, um, thinking about police accountability, don't actually know what are the rules that are guiding police officers in the use of these devices. Uh, in many of those places, um, the evidentiary value of you know, footage that's captured through a camera, meaning uh, a police shooting or, uh, you know, an incident that involves a police officer, you know, maybe stepping, overstepping, you know, the, the line. Uh, much of that footage um, in many places is not even available to the public. In other cases, um, police officers have access to the actual footage, um, 
before they even have to write a report, meaning that they can look at the footage and, and find ways to frame and justify what's happening in the footage when they're writing their official report. Um, so you see this way, this kind of example of uh, it, in the wave of police accountability, the solution that's being promoted is a technological one. Um, and the intent, um, and I would say the intent from folks at the very top of the White House and the Department of Justice, I'm sure, were, were noble, um, or it was a noble intent, but in practice, uh, you see the disbursement of a technology that is facing the community, it's not actually facing the police officer. Uh, and there have been examples uh, recently of where you know you see police officers arrest somebody in a fairly brutal way, like, you know, really beat the person up, um, and in the video narrate what is happening to justify what's happening. So they'll say like, "Stop resisting arrest," or "I think he's got, uh, you know, I think he's got a gun," or something to justify what the body worn camera footage will show. There was one example in Florida where the gentleman. Um, literally raised his hands, started getting down on the floor in an empty parking lot because he was being chased by police. Um, and, you know, several police officers jumped at him, was, you know, forced him, like, beat him up pretty, pretty badly. Um, and in the, in the footage, you know, they're talking about how he's resisting arrest. You know, there was an independent kind of camera uh, in this parking lot that was kind of looking down at the scene. And, and you see clearly that he had his hands up. He wasn't resisting. He was just getting on the ground. So you see examples of where um, this is being utilized in the school no longer for accountability, but just to justify police action. Um, and more, uh, more consequently, um, the, one of the main manufacturers of these devices, uh, this company called Taser, um, is also now increasingly finding uh, functionality to interface body-worn cameras with face recognition technology, meaning that police officers out and about can immediately run face recognition searches with the in real time of the people that they are you know, coming in contact with. Um, so in many cases, this could be someone randomly just walking down the street, um, but a face recognition search may, may be run on them, and there may be an outstanding warrant or a reason why they may need to be stopped. Um, so now you see this, this functionality, uh, you know, this increased kind of functionality that, again, pushes us further and further away from uh, police accountability and more into the realm of this just being an extra surveillance tool for the purpose of policing. Um, so that's one example. The other I wanted to speak to was the use of stingrays um, or cell phone interceptors. They're also known as imsy captures, and I'm sure there's plenty of other fancy names we can come up for them. But um, essentially what these devices are is that they, they, are, um, they mimic cell phone towers, and they're about the size of a briefcase in most cases, um, and they can be deployed out in a given neighborhood. Um, and immediately what it'll do is it'll start pulling, um, it'll start duping local, any cell phone within range to start communicating with it. So in that way, it can capture data. It can capture call logs, text messages, GPS location data. There's some that can do even more, actually intercept actual phone calls that are happening in place. Um, so this very powerful device, um, captures data in a very indiscriminate way, almost in a dragnet way. Um, so if you happen to be in a neighborhood where a Stingray device is, is being deployed, your phone um, and the data within your phone could be readily accessed by local police departments uh, in that place. Now they exist um, in, I think 71 uh, local police departments have access to this kind of a device. Um, the Department of Justice um, has bought and has access to over 300 of these devices that they use um, across their different federal agencies, including the Federal Bureau of Investigation, um, and you know, uh, the Department of Homeland Security has access to over 100 uh, of these devices that they use for you know, their immigration enforcement tactics. Um, and you know, they've also provided grants um, to local police departments. So the Department of Homeland Security provided $1.8 million for local police departments to adopt these, these specific technologies. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, has done the same thing. And, and where they've done it, they've also required local police departments to sign non-disclosure agreements, meaning that um, you know, uh, locally, uh, those communities don't actually know that their police department has access, or not even given an opportunity to like, speak out on why they wouldn't want their local police department to have access to this very powerful device. Um, we looked at um, how this device was being used in one particular community in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and 
we did some research uh, to, to just understand how this device is being used there. Um, and we picked Baltimore because Baltimore is one of these cities that, like many big cities in the United States, has a reputation of fairly messed up racist policing. Um, and what we found in terms of this device, like based on records requests, uh, public FOIA requests, is that in that city, since 2007, this is when they bought this Stingway device, they used it 4,300 times. Um, so to give you a breakdown of what that looks like, that's about more than once a day for several years. Um, and this very powerful device uh, in this city, uh, they, they were operating it and didn't even have to get a warrant, meaning that they didn't need to go to a federal judge um, or any judge for that matter and say, you know what, um, we're trying to use um, this cell phone interceptor um, and uh, and here are the reasons we're trying to use it. Here's what we're trying to target. They didn't need to make a case to anybody. So essentially, they could just deploy this device out in the community without any real oversight. Um, there wasn't a working policy for this device either, so there weren't any rules to the road. So what do you do with the data that you capture? No rules to the road, so they can keep it indefinitely, essentially. Um, so you, you must imagine that for a device that uh, is as powerful as this, they, they must be you know, tackling some really hardcore crime. Like, you know, if any of you folks have ever seen the show The Wire, which takes place in Baltimore, um, you know, this show would have been over essentially one episode with this device. Um, <laughs> but, I, but you know, how it's being used in Baltimore is not really you know, to tackle uh, Angela Barksdale or, or something like that, or, or, or Stringer Bell. Um, there, one of the examples that we put in a complaint that we, that we put together um, to the Federal Communications Commission is that they used this device to capture someone who had stolen chicken wings from a pizza place. Um, so, you know, petty theft, essentially. Uh, in other cases, it was being used to track down someone who was harassing someone via text messages. Um, you know, no actual, like, hardcore crime being committed but yet this very powerful device that costs anywhere from $30,000 to $100,000 just being used um, you know, for this purpose. Around the same time, so what we did is we captured this data, we put it into a complaint, and we filed with the Federal Communications Commission, making the argument that um, this device that functions on what we call a license spectrum, so you know, your cell phones operate on spectrum with your you know, local wireless provider, whoever that may be, uh, that provider has you know, paid for a license to operate um, you know, wirelessly. This device doesn't do that. There's no license that's being granted to it to, to operate in these, in these places. Um, and, it's, and it's duping cell phones to communicate with it. And we make the argument that it could also affect um, disrupt phone calls that you're making to your family. Um, it could disrupt emergency phone calls that are being made to 911. Um, so we filed a complaint with the Federal Communications Commission here in the United States, making the argument that uh, the way these stingray, stingray devices are being used by police departments, uh, and specifically in Baltimore, um, were unlawful. It's an unlawful use of, of this device to violate spectrum law. Um, so we filed that complaint, and um, you know, consequently, around the same time that we did, the Department of Justice released a report um, on, on Baltimore, and uh, it detailed a pattern of racist policing uh, of how Baltimore police departments just stop black people more. Uh, they have higher arrest rates in those communities. Um, and in our complaint, we actually did a demographic map of where the black community lives in, in Baltimore and overlaid that with the places where um, you know, stingray devices had been used. And, and you see a very clear overlap. So again, we see um, with this device in particular, uh, it only increases contact with police departments, increases uh, arrest rates, increases um, you know, unlawful interactions between police departments and, and communities of color uh, in a place like Baltimore. And we filed, we generated complaints for Los Angeles and Chicago, and we're seeing similar trends there. So it's safe to say in a lot of places where racist and biased policing is already in place, this technology only really amplifies it. It doesn't really address it or make it uh, any less worse. So the last um, technology I'll speak to really quickly is social media surveillance. Um, you know, and, and so to give a quick primer to this, the, the role of social media um, for activism um, can't be understated, um, or can't be overstated, I should say. Um, and one specific example I'll point to is um, 
sought to see here in the United States. Um, you know, under the new administration, there was an attempt to implement a Muslim ban. You know, and, and we'll call it that because that's actually what the president himself says he's called it. That's what the surrogates called it. It's a Muslim ban, in effect. Um, and in the aftermath of that Muslim ban being put into place, we saw massive amounts of activism um, uh, developing and, and, and traveling to local airports to protest the, the implementation of, of this Muslim ban. Um, a lot of that organizing really um, happened online and through social media. Um, and there's been articles that have been written that kind of detail the, the exact kind of etymology of like this activism. You, know, you can track it down to a Facebook post over here of someone saying, we need to go out to airports. Um, and you see ways in which social media was used in very innovative ways to, like, to ensure that people are act actively going out and protesting. Um, so I say that to say that um, you know, for, for activists, uh, social media is a very critical tool. Um, what we understand with social media surveillance is that um, there are companies that have made a market of promoting tools to law enforcement agencies that allow for them to use data that's collected by social media platforms um, and convert them into tools that police departments can use to you know, actively search um, you know, uh, through, through social media platforms. And companies like Media Sonar and Geopedia, what they do is they collect the, the back end um, API data that you know, social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram make available to developers. And they take that data and have converted it into, into tools that um, can be used by local police departments. Uh, at this point, several police, I mean, there are dozens of police departments across the country that have purchased these tools. Um, and the ways that these companies market these tools, because um, we, we were able to get some access to their marketing materials, they point to examples like Ferguson um, and Baltimore in response to uprisings against police violence. They, they, they detail how uh, this tool was used by those local police departments to track and surveil local activists. Um, and so they, you know, they actually speak about you know, political activists as exigent, exigent threats. So they apply this layer of criminality to people who are out there saying Black Lives Matter um, and protesting against police violence. Um, and these tools allow police departments to search by hashtags, to search for um, you know, specific users to search for, you know, crops of people based on interests. Um, so if you've ever put hashtag Black Lives Matter on your social media platform, a lot of that backend API data is now available to local police departments. Um, and the, the data they have access to is a lot deeper than just, you know, the Facebook post that we put up. They also have access to geolocation, photos, etc. cetera. Um, and, and so these tools are very powerful. Um, and what we did is we filed a letter with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram in partnership with the American Civil Liberties Union and the Color, the Color of Change, uh, which is a, you know, one of the largest online black civil rights organizations in, in the US. Stephen, sorry uh, to interrupt. I'll, just, I'll give you a two minute warning if that's all right. Perfect, all right. Um, so you know, we filed a letter with, with Facebook and told them, one, you have to cut off contact or you have to cut off your relationships with these companies to, um, you know, you need to put policies in place that explicitly prevent uh, the use of your user's data for the purpose of surveillance. Um, and lucky to say, uh, this past Monday, they did both. Um, so we had a huge victory in that regard with, with Facebook and Instagram and with Twitter back in, in December. Um, so to summarize my points, uh, just to close me out and apologize for going a little bit over, um, the application of technology to policing doesn't uh, doesn't take away the underlying bias that exists in policing. And in many cases, it makes it worse. Um, and so in this regard, technology is not neutral. And we, we hear um, ways in which technologists and uh, people that are adopting these technologies speak to the fact that bias isn't inherent in these technologies but because the technology can't be racist. Um, uh, the other point I'll make is that technology is being adopted at a quicker pace than laws can keep up. Um, so there's a real need for oversight and understanding like what are the conditions around surveillance that exist in communities. Um, and in many cases we don't know because that's by design where, where, where it's being deployed in ways that we can't figure things out. So research in that regard is, is super critical. Um, and under the current political conditions, especially here in the United States um, with the Trump administration, 
technology will be relied on more to target specific communities. It already is being used in that way. Um, and uh, so in terms of thinking about solutions, the points I'll make really quickly is that current approaches to policing cannot be reformed. Um, we believe that have a really strong belief that technology as a, as a vehicle for reform will not change um, the underlying bias in policing. All reforms are not equal, that false solutions can be dangerous, and, and we bring up body on camera as a specific example of that. Um, and here in the United States in particular, who you are and not what you do is the primary determinant of whether you are surveilling the United States. Um, my colleague at Color of Change, uh, Brandy Collins, likes to say, to be black in America is to be, to be surveilled. Um, and then leadership must be forged at the site of impact. Um, when at every site, whether it's at organizing, research, uh, the communities most impacted must be at the center of that conversation. That's been the strongest lesson that we've learned in the work that we've done um, to transform our media system. Um, our campaigns uh, have been a reflection of that, and I would encourage um, in, in your work um, to really ensure that, that their leadership is centered in the work that you do. Um, and I'll, I'll stop right there.